Commentary on Thus Spake Zarathustra, Part 4, on Chastity. This is a remarkable, it's even hard to it, keep track of how remarkable this section is, very brief. But basically, Nietzsche is raising the question here of sex and to raise sexuality within a philosophical context in the 19th century was uh, more, pretty rare to almost unheard of. Now, the Greeks would talk a little bit more about this, the symposium famously, but other works as well. But for, you know, when you're thinking of models like uh, Hegel and Kant as your key philosophical minds of, of Nietzsche's time, Fichte, these kinds of people, well, um, they didn't talk a lot about these sorts of issues. And so to raise this as directly as uh, Nietzsche does here is pretty remarkable. And then his take on it is even more remarkable because he says, here, do I commit you to chastity? Chastity is a virtue for the few, but for most nearer a vice. And now in, in Nietzsche's time, of course, sex was seemed uh, culturally, the th theory of culture, of course, was that it's a, uh, that it's a vice and it's an animalistic and one should avoid sexuality and discussions of sexuality, of course, is, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't be uh, raised and serious people and philosophical people didn't talk about these things. And so chastity was held up as a virtue. <clears throat> of course, it was a virtue honored much more in the breach than in the practice. And this is precisely what he's driving at, is to counsel people to chastity against the, their own nature is wrong. But notice this means that good and evil, right and wrong, um, is relative to the individual. And so you, how you, um, what makes something right and what makes something wrong depends on the individual themselves. And so, again, this is that sliding scale. It's why trying to figure out what he feels about any particular issue is, is difficult. Is because it's not, you know, he's not saying this is right and that's wrong and this is right and that's wrong. He's saying, wow, look, some people who want to be chaste shouldn't. And he says, uh, you know, the latter completely abstain, but the bitch sensuality leers out enviously of all that they do. So even if you are chaste, which in theory is the right thing to do, if you shouldn't be chaste, then the sensuality that's native to you sort of destroys everything. And so it's actually worse for you to be chaste than it is not to be chaste. And so, that you know, even if you're doing theoretically the right thing, Nietzsche says, well, potentially you're doing the wrong thing. Um, and so it matters on how you take it, how you do it, how it affects you, um, not what you're doing specifically. And he says, uh, do I speak of dirty things? In his time, the answer is yes. That's right. It is a dirty thing um, in his time. But he says, for me, that is not the worst. Not when the truth is dirty, but when it is shallow, are the wise hesitant to step into the water. So he's like, you know, this is not a question that should not be addressed. You know, you want to address these questions if they're deep, if they're important. And the sort of incredible... Uh, hypocrisy that he saw in his culture drove him to think this is a significant and serious issue that should be addressed. And so he addresses it very directly. And even compared to our own time where we say, oh, well, we're much more sexually liberated, which in some ways we are, notice it's not, you know, sexual liberation becomes to be hypersexualized as opposed to say, be however you are natively. And so it, what, what Nietzsche is calling for, what Zarathustra here is talking about is, you know, what works for you? What is your, in your nature? What is the best way to address that rather than being chaste or, or indulging your sensual desires? You see, either of those could be correct and either of those could be wrong. And that is the tricky part. But I think this very brief chapter offers a couple of examples of A, uh, Nietzsche's forthrightness to address something that his society says should not be talked about by serious people and serious works, and two, to take this sort of complex sliding scale uh, uh, measure of all things, which of course throws people off because you're, they're looking for arguments about right and wrong as opposed to perhaps in this case you would say healthful um, and true to one's nature. And because our natures are different, not wildly different, but variable within a certain range, then, 
you know, you don't get the correct, one correct answer. And then finally, he, he dislikes this notion of chastity as suffering. He says, truly, there are those who are chased from the ground up. They are kind of heart and laugh more easily and more deeply than you. They laugh about chastity and ask, what is chastity? You know, it. there it is, right? It's like, well, if it doesn't bother you, if you don't even think, if you don't even know about it, right, what is it? They don't know what you're talking about, right? Then this, the, it's not a burden for you. They laugh. They're lighthearted. We offered this guest chastity shelter in our hearts, and now it lives with us. May it stay as long as it wants. So even then, it's like, well, let chastity stay as long as it wants. But when it decides to leave, that's fine too. And so this is, uh, you know, you can charge moral relativism here quite correctly because this is precisely what he's arguing for. And for his time and place, this is remarkably... Um, forward-looking, I guess one could say. On the friend. And here Nietzsche really is channeling for the ancients. It's always important to remember that he was a uh, philological scholar of ancient languages of, you know, of, of the first order at a time when that was an incredibly uh, noble undertaking. Culturally, you got a lot of points for this, and he was considered to be very much amongst the best of his time. And so when he talks about a friend, he's channeling a lot for the ancients who wrote a lot about friendship and who took friendship very seriously because so much of the ancient world, your position in society was chosen, your family was chosen, often your who you married was chosen, and therefore um, the only real you know, uh, life altering choice you could make were the people with whom one spent time. And so friendship really, really mattered. They took it incredibly seriously and felt that it was the key often to the quality of one's life. And so, you know, this tension that Nietzsche feels between he wanted friends, he was not very good at being a friend. Uh, and so he spent a lot of time alone, and you get all this tension in this section where he says, One is always too many around me, so thinks the hermit. Always one times one gives two in the long run. Right? So if you're going to be a hermit, the friend is too many because it's that extra voice that, that distracts you from your loneliness. Um, our belief in others betrays where we would like to believe in ourselves. Our desire for a friend is our betrayer, right? So this... Ah, we want someone who reflects ourselves back to us, he says. And he, he, you know, that desire for the other, that desire for the friend quite directly is vexing for, for Nietzsche because he never really was that good at it because he was such, you know, he's sort of very extreme, hard to deal with as one can imagine. Um, you want to wear no clothes in front of your friend. It should honor your friend that you want to show yourself as you are. But for that, he curses you to the devil. Yes, when you're so out of step with it, with your own time and so such a harsh critic and so aggressive, yet people found him shocking. And so, you know, that notion of always needing to hedge. And this, of course, is, you know, do you hedge for your friend? Do you respect your friend and show him your true feelings? Um, I don't think he answers this very well in here, but he certainly raises a lot of the issues. You cannot dress too beautifully for your friend. Just contradicting what you said, you know, what he said a couple of uh, sentences before where he says, you don't wear, don't wear anything. That's what you want to do, but you also cannot dress too beautifully. In this sense, he means he's, of course, playing with that paradox. Again, he's often playing word games and playing these paradoxical games, which is part of what makes it confusing. First, he says you should be naked. Now he says you should not, you cannot dress too beautifully. But the idea is, therefore, you become for him an arrow and a yearning for the overman. You want to make yourself great, beautiful in this case, well-dressed, um, metaphorically speaking, so that you create a desire in your friend, and together you, you create a desire for and work toward something that is better than what you are. Um, may your compassion for your friend hide under a hard shell. You shall lose a tooth biting into it. Thus it will have subtlety and sweetness. Are you fresh air and solitude and bread and medicine for your friend? Many cannot loosen their own chains, but can still be their friend's liberator. So, you know, compassion should be hidden. And in several places, Nietzsche raises this point that to be a, a good friend means 
you want to have compassion, but you don't want that to, to rule your relations with them because sometimes perhaps you want to be aggressive with them or they need it. You know, sometimes we need a, a, a swift kick from our friends to sort of get our minds right. And, and the, that is a type of compassion, but it's not just, you know, sympathizing with, oh, I feel bad for you. It's like, well, sometimes you need people to say, I don't feel bad for you at all because that was stupid. And this is sort of what Nietzsche's driving at. Are you fresh hair? and solitude and bread and medicine for your friend? You know, are, are you helping them, aiding them, making them uh, well, making them better? And he makes this interesting point that even if you can't loosen your own chains, you can still be someone else's liberator. Now, this is a very interesting uh, concept, which of course also runs counter then to something that he just said earlier about dressing beautifully so that you're, you create the, the desire for and point the way to the overman. But here he says, hey, even if you can't get out of your change, even if you aren't doing a good job of liberating yourself and moving towards uh, the overman, perhaps you can still help liberate your friend. The, and that, again, this idea of, of, of liberation, of freeing. And I have always has this concept that we should give our lives to the person to our immediate left because it's so much clearer from the outside what other people need than it is to us on the inside from what we need, I think, is often a, a problem that we struggle with. And so this is, I think, what he's talking about here, that you can help, you can be medicine, solitude, bread for a friend, uh, even, even if you struggle. And since Nietzsche certainly felt his struggle so mightily, I think he still felt that he could be helpful. Are you a slave? Then you cannot be a friend. Are you a tyrant? Then you cannot have a friend. You know, this is, again, this is right back to the ancient world where they did not want to be a slave and they feared tyrants. Tyrants were a problem. Slaves, you don't want to be a slave. You want to be in that independent realm where you can choose. And it's the choosing of those people, naming those who are your friends, which he, he took very seriously. Um, then you get this great section where on Nietzsche on women is always a problem. We're going to see that coming up, and I'll address that more when we get to the a little old women's section, which is sort of, wow, reprehensible. But nonetheless, it's what he wrote. Um, he says, women can't be friends. Women are still incapable of friendship. And this is one of those hurdles that Nietzsche did not clear. You know, he battled anti-Semitism, battled the nation state, you know, fought with uh, the religious zealotry and idolatry and, you know, the worship of money. I mean, he really got out of a lot of boxes that his society had put him in and he paid a huge price for that. But here we see one. He could never quite accept that women could be equal to men. This changes in the later books, by the way, to a certain extent. But in this book, you still see him with this notion that women simply can't be friends because they are not liberated in the same way as some men. And so a lot of, uh, you know, women who read this are like, wow, this is incredibly, uh, you know, sort of of put down of women and it is of course uh, but remember that he also puts 98 percent of men in precisely the same category um, and he and you see this here woman is still incapable of friendship but tell me man who amongst you is capable of friendship and there it is this is his delivery so remember in the in the opening of Zarathustra he goes to the town and he talks to the marketplace and he talks to everybody uh, and he realizes, oh, that was the mistake. I am not, I do not have the words for the ears of everybody, only for the select few. But for him, the select few only includes men. He just thought that women couldn't get there, could not be liberated. And again, I'll talk more about that on the section on little old women. Um, and that notion really sort of blinkered him. However, his biography helps explain that, but it's, it's still not an excuse. But he said, alas, your poverty, you men, and your smallness of soul. So there it is. Women and 98% of men. So most men and all women is how he felt about it. As much as you give to your friends, I want to give to my enemies and would not become the poor thereby. There is comradeship. Let there be friendship. So he really put a high emphasis on this uh, using, again, ancient world models where people would die for their friends, where they would take them in when they were refugees, where they would, you know, pay for their kids to go to college. I mean, they really did amazing things uh, for their friends and they, they, they valued it and talked about it and, and thought about it and reflected on it in many, many philosophical works because of how important they felt. And he looked around his world and saw, ah, what you have is comrades. You have people you hang out with. Are they really their friends? 
he thought most men um, simply were incapable of actually being friends because they are either a type of slave or they wanted to be a tyrant, but they weren't great enough for friendship. Of a thousand goals and one, Zarathustra has seen many lands and many peoples. Thus he discovered the goods and evils of many people. Zarathustra has found no greater power on earth than good and evil. Key insight for this entire work, and generally for Nietzsche's thought as it's developed to this point, is he's looked around at societies and he said, ah, <clears throat> there isn't an external good and an external evil. It's not given by God. It's not in the book. It doesn't come from the king. It does not justified and sanctified by the state. People, creators in particular, has created our values. And creating it, when you create those values, you create the nature and content of your society and, and sort of the, the expression of your culture. What you value is what becomes expressed. And so when you want to think about a culture, Nietzsche argues, what you need to do is understand where its values came from, who created them, and why. They're not given from God. They don't come from on high. They're created by people for specific problems to solve particular issues. And when they do that, they create their culture. And then they try to pretend like it wasn't created, that it was natural or it comes from God or something like this. And this insight is, is you know, just central to what Nietzsche is talking about. And he gives you the examples here. It gives you first the Greeks to be first in all things and to excel all others. Your soul should love no one except the friend. There it is. Hence the importance of friendship. You, who do you love? You love your friend. Um, this made the souls of the Greeks tremble. To tell the truth and handle the bow and arrow well. This was the, this was the ideal of the Persian Empire. Uh, to honor thy father and mother and to obey their will to the roots of your soul. So this, this comes to us from the Jewish society. This is from the uh, Old Testament Judaism. And that notion of their, their thereby, their culture became eternal. To be loyal and from loyalty to risk honor and blood, even for evil and dangerous ends. This is the Romans, of course. So four different notions of core values creates four different societies, all of which were major and important, all of which have been hugely influential, but all of which are different. And so step one is to recognize this to see that different cultures have different values. Step two is to then go, ah, change of values, that is change in creators. Whomever must be a creator is always a destroyer. So that to create is to change values. This is how it is. It, it, the values are what matter. And so those who create the values are incredibly important. <clears throat> but because people already always have values, to create new values, one has to either um, reduce the importance of, or as this case, he says, destroy the old values, overcome the old values, replace them, make them less important, um, somehow get around them so that new values can take their place. And you see this just, you know, if we think we're a society, of course, one of our core values is money. And you go, wow, all sorts of things that in the old world, people would not have thought was worth doing for money. Um, people do now because money has basically become its own end. And so those values, the value of money has replaced a con all, a, many other values that used to exist. Family used to be more important than money. This is clearly not the case so much anymore. At least family much less important, money much more important. And so those sorts of transformations of values transform your whole society. They, they're, they aren't, these aren't small things. These are the biggest, most important things. People once hung a table of good over themselves. Love that wants to rule and love that wants to obey created these tables for them. The joy of the herd is older than the joy of the individual. As long as the conscience of the herd is deemed good, only a bad conscience says, I. Ah, this also creates another problem. The values of everyone, the values of a culture or society are necessarily the values of everyone, as it were, um, until you get this notion of, oh, maybe the individual is important. And Nietzsche recognizes that that value, the valuing of the individual, 
is itself a revolution in the tables of good and evils. That the increasing value, which of course he strongly endorses, the increasing value and uh, um, sort of recognition given to every individual is a breaking of those old tables. That creating the new values breaks old values. And in this case, the new value of the individual necessarily runs against the old value, which says the, the good of the many. Um, whatever everybody believes, that's what we must go with. And so this is a remarkable change and remarkable insight that he has on the variability of good and evil, that it does not come from a transcendent place. There's no absolute answer to these sorts of questions. And that finally, that the creating of values and that the change that those values then inculcate into society is really where the power of transforming a culture um, or an understanding of a culture comes from. on the love of one's neighbors. Much like the flies in the marketplace, basically run away from your neighbors. Um, he talks about all this, you know, love your neighbor, uh, you know, of course, this Old Testament rev- reference, um, loving your neighbor and, and as yourself, these sorts, of, these sorts of ideals, which were sort of parroted, he thought were simply bad conscience. He does not trust the crowd. He does not trust the neighbors because he sees this notion of any mixing of large groups of people as basically corrupting of the individual. I would, that you could not tolerate any neighbor or their neighbors because it's, he says this because if you're just randomly saying, oh, my neighbors are pretty good, I associate with them, I get along with them, they get along with me, this means necessarily that you're hedging yourself down. That you're sort of going, well, I don't want to express too much. I don't want to upset them. I want them to like me, which he says is very, this is, you know, horrible idea. If you want them to like you, then you're looking to them to approve of what you're doing. Now you've given, given away half your power because you know what they're going to like. They're going to like what they're supposed to like because this is what the groups do. They form a sort of homogenous standard, which of course Nietzsche just consistently dislikes. He says, if you're going to be yourself, just like in the last section, uh, then what you need to do is probably break with your neighbors. And hence he says, you know, flee. (laughs) He says, flee from your neighbors. I don't counsel you to love your neighbors. I counsel you to flee from them. Uh, He says, not the neighbor do I teach you, but the friend. May the friend be to you the celebration of the earth and a forerunner of the overman. I teach to you that your friend and his overflowing heart, but one must learn to be a sponge if he would be loved by an overflowing heart. So don't go to the group, don't go to the neighbors, go to the friend. Of course, we also just had the section on friendship. So don't, you know, the few, uh, the remote, the, um, the rare. This is always what Nietzsche comes back to because he distrusts crowds, he distrusts groups, and he, and he only wants to emphasize the individual and maybe the individual with a friend or two. Let the future of the farthest be the cause of your today. In your friend, you shall love the overman as your cause. My brothers, to love of your neighbors, I do not counsel you. I counsel you to the love of the farthest. That's the concept. Don't go to your neighbors. Don't be friends with your neighbors. Don't associate with them. Don't look for them for approval, uh, but rather flee from them, just like the marketplace, just like any crowd. You have to go away. And you can go all the way back to the original parable, which he keeps referencing, where he went to the marketplace. He was with everybody. He's in the neighborhood, as it were, and bad things happen. And it's only when he goes away and puts down all those burdens and puts down all those ideas, literally a corpse that he was carrying, does he recognize like, oh, that doesn't work. The neighbors, the friends, the crowds, this is not going to uh, be communicable to them and not helpful for me. I need the few. I need the the friends, the ones who are who love me and who I can love them, and together we can sort of shoot for the farthest. And the farthest, of course, here play on words, which is the farthest from your neighbors. So do not love your neighbors, but rather flee from them. On the way of the Creator, and having just uh, heard the section on a thousand goals and one the notion of the creator of values being this absolutely core um, issue. So when you hit this uh, title, you should be ready for it, right? On the way of the creator. 
<clears throat> do you, my brothers, want to go into solitude? Do you want to seek the path to yourself? Then pause a little longer and hear me. And here we go. Again, this is what's going to happen when you do that. Whomever seeks themselves will easily become lost. All solitude is guilt. Thus speaks the herd, and you have long been part of the herd. Ah, so here's the idea. You've been told that if you go for yourself, ah, you're going to be in trouble. You might be lost. It's, you know, it's guilt that you're supposed to be in the neighborhood, right? You're supposed to be doing the, fulfilling all the obligations that you have. And even if you break from that, you're still going to carry that voice with you. And he says, but do you want to go on the path of misery, which is a path to yourself? So show me your right and your power for it. Are you a new power and a new right, a first mover, a self-propelled wheel? Can you even compel the stars to revolve around you? Ah, there it is. If you're going to create new values, you have to make them yourself, right? That's, that's what he's looking for. Alas, there are so many great thoughts that are no more than bellows. They inflate and make emptier, right? So this is, you know, that he, that's his why he says this is for the few. He says, can you really make yourself a self-propelled wheel? Can you find your own drive? And if you go all the way back, this is the three transformations. So you've thrown off the weight. You've thrown off the you must. You've killed the dragon of you must. Um, but now can you become the child? Can you play? He even says the child, the self-propelled wheel. He calls the child that. Can you can you make it a play? Can you make the, ro- the very stars revolve around your ideas and yourself? Ooh, very tricky. And then there's this great notion, which again, I've had many conversations with people that, say that this seems to be confusing. Free, your co- you call yourself? Your ruling thought, I would hear, and not that you have thrown off the yoke. So, uh, and this is, if you can get this, if nothing else out of this section, this one idea is very useful because when you talk to people or see in philosophical discussions or cultural issues all the time, people are always talking about free, free yourself from this, free yourself from that, free, you know, free, 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 I'm free, I liberate myself. Free for what? Right? Freedom is useless. It's, 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 It's not, you know, free is great, but now what are you going to do with your freedom? He, this is what Nietzsche wants to know. If you're going to free yourself to do something stupid and life-destroying and unpleasant, then he thinks you shouldn't be free, right? Your ruling thought, I would hear, and not that you have thrown off the yoke. There are many who have thrown off their last shred of worth when they threw off their servitude. Ah, there it is, right? Just, you know, okay, you freed yourself. Have you made yourself better? Perhaps you were better and had power when you were serving. Maybe you had you, this made you better and healthier and, and, and a more impressive person. So if you're going to be free, free for what? What is the point of your freedom? What have you chosen to do with it? And that is a, that's, that sort of uh, brings people up short. I mean, that's sort of often when people say, oh, you know, I'm free from this or free from that. And instead they say, okay, now you're free. Great. Now you have to choose. Oh, we hate that. Right, that notion of well, I've liberated myself now. I have a multitude of choices. What you choose now says a lot about you, and so people tend to are often avoid making that choice. <clears throat> you know, oh, I can live anywhere I want. Great, where do you want to live? Well, wherever you live, this is a self-imposed restriction. You've you've just thrown away that freedom by choosing the place, and so people often just move from place to place. There are people who do this; they just move from place to place to place because if they ever say, oh, this is where I am, well, they've given up that freedom. And so Nietzsche's like, well, that's just not choosing, right? Unless you want to just be a nomad, then say, well, I want to be a nomad, which is fine too. But you have to, but make that choice. I'm never going to settle someplace. I want to move around all the time. I'm not going to settle. But people say, oh, I might want to be here. I might want to be there. Yeah, this is not going to work for Nietzsche. So this notion of freeing, great, free yourself, but for what? There's got to be a purpose for freeing yourself. Yeah, and then he says, what will happen to you then is, but one day solitude will make you weary. One day your courage will crumble and you will gnash your teeth. One day you will cry out loud, I am all alone. You'll cry out, one day you will cry out, all is false. These are feelings that want the death of the solitary. They do not succeed, then they must themselves die. But do you have the courage to be a murderer? You know, this is, again, when, when he invokes this language of violence, who, is he, who are you murdering here? 
Who are you attacking? It's like the warrior section. Well, you're attacking yourself. You're murdering a part of yourself. If, if For something to be true, you have to kill that notion of, oh, everything is false, but then you have to make it true. It becomes your responsibility. This is the responsibility of the creator. How would you be just towards me, you must say? I choose for myself your injustice as my allotted portion. Right? You, People are not going to know how to deal with this. So you're choosing what your justice is, but this doesn't work for other people. You're choosing to be alone. You're necessarily cutting yourself off from the herd. This is the reciprocal part of this. If you flee your neighbors, you're not with your neighbors, right? If you break with your social values, then you've broken with your social values. And so you're like, oh, now what do you do? And then he says, beware also of the holy simplicity. Everything is not simple. They consider unholy and they like to play with fire at the stake. Wow. So beware also the holy simplicity. Everything that is not simple, they consider unholy and they like to play with fire at the stake. So again, you know, okay, make your truth simple and easy and clear. Otherwise, we don't like it. So it's, it's all of these, you know, three steps or, you know, the three-minute video that will change your life. It's simple. It's clear. It's easy. Yeah, if you don't do that, well, ooh, people get angry, right? So this, this is what he's talking about when he talks about the role of the creator. So he talks about liberating yourself, but liberating yourself for what? And that when you do that, you're going to run into these real necessary psychological problems because you're still going to have the voice of your society in, the, in your mind. And to kill those voices is, in fact, to murder or kill part of yourself. You're not murdering the herd. You're not murdering the other people. He never suggests this. He says, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're at war with yourself. You're trying to kill those old voices so that your child can come back and play and liberate yourself for play. And then he says, Go into your isolation with your love and your creating, my brothers, and only later will, you, will it limp after. With my tears, go into your isolation, my brothers. I love him who wants to create over and beyond himself and therefore perishes. There it is, right? If you want to create beyond yourself, part of you has to perish. Some part of you, your old part, your childhood, your upbringing is likely to have to go away. You're going to have to give up some dreams. To pursue something, you have to give up something else. In fact, you have to give up a lot of something else's. And that is precisely the problem here. And so Nietzsche very much encourages people to do this, but he also recognizes that it's filled with all kinds of pitfalls. And even though it's great and wonderful and driven by love, it is also difficult and treacherous. And so, you know, be, be leery, be careful.